Welcome students to chapter 17, in which I'm going to teach you some additional aspects of aqueous equilibria. Now I know what you're thinking. There are additional aspects of aqueous equilibria. We've already learned so much. I know, I know. Bear with me. In the course of just a few, maybe a couple dozen more videos, we're going to know everything there is at a general chemistry level, at least, about aqueous equilibria. Dang. That word has given me a tongue twister today. But before we begin, I want to begin by beginning a beginning by sharing you a funny cat of the day from quickmeme.com. Why did the white bear dissolve in water? Because it was polar. <laughs> okay, I also wanted to share with you. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. I also want to share you a, uh, with you an interesting chemistry fun fact. This is about DEET, which is a molecule that is found in a lot of mosquito and other bug repellents, but is formerly known as n diethyl m toluamide whose structure is shown here. This summer you may well have used DEET-containing products to ward off mosquitoes, ticks, and other anthropod pests. The synthesis of DEET was first reported in Romanian and German journals in 1929. The U.S. Army formulated it as a repellent after World War II, and it was commercialized in 1957. Its odor is unpleasant to pests and people to a certain extent, and counteracts body odors that attract them. Isn't that neat? Body odors. Well, after this series of lectures from Chapter 17, which will cover Sections 1, 2, and 3, you guys should be able to explain the common ion effect and perform pH calculations for common ion effect problems, explain what buffered solutions are, and identify an acid-salt pair that will form a buffered solution, calculate the pH of a buffered solution using both the common ion effect approach and the henderson hasselbalch equation, explain what an acid-base titration is, and distinguish between a strong acid-strong base titration curve, a strong base-strong acid titration titration curve and a weak acid strong base titration curve and perform titration calculations for both strong acid strong base and weak acid strong base titrations. That's the lineup. Let's get started. Beginning with the common ion effect. In our last chapter we learned that unlike strong acids whose reaction arrows are practically one way, weak acids equilibria have a more balanced reactant to product ratio. That is, weak acids dissociate in a back and forth arrow way, that is, in an equilibrium way, to release their conjugate bases A minus and H3O plus, according to this generic equation. Let's look at a specific example now, the dissolution of acetic acid, whose formula is given here, in water. When acetic acid is cast into water, it dissociates in an equilibrium setting to yield acetate, its conjugate base, and hydronium H3O plus. Now I want you to sort of look at this reaction, keep it in mind, we're going to move it to the top of the slide right here. I want you to imagine this reaction that I just showed you. I'm going to ask you this question. What do you think would happen if we had this reaction going and then we suddenly added some sodium acetate? Think about this for a minute. What would it do? Well, once again, because sodium acetate is an ionic compound that is a strong electrolyte, it dissolves freely in water, like this, to once again yield acetate and sodium cation. So adding sodium acetate to our system would increase the amount of acetate, this thing right here, and would then drive this equilibrium reaction to the left by Le Chatelier's principle. Let's focus then on these two reactions. So as we look at these reactions mixed together, what happens then is that Increased acetate stemming from the sodium acetate that I've added would add in or feed back into this reaction above in solution and drive it backwards according to Le Chatelier's principle. You got that? Hopefully it makes sense. So whenever we have a weak acid then and we dissolve a strong electrolyte that produces the conjugate base of that acid, the weak acid's equilibrium will get driven to the left. This is called the common ion effect. It takes us then to a wonderful problem. What is the fluoride ion concentration and approximate pH of a solution that is 0.15 molar in HF and 0.05 molar in HCl? The Ka of HF, by the way, is 6.8 times 10 to the negative fourth. Now I invite you to attempt this on your own. Then if you wish, you can click this link which will take you to a separate video in which I'll show you how to do it on the board. And here's another problem. 
calculate the pH of formic acid solution that is 0.311 molar in formic acid and 0.189 molar in sodium formate. The Ka of formic acid is 1.77 times 10 to the negative fourth. As per usual, I'm not going to show you how to do this here. You're welcome to attempt it on your own. And then if you wish, you can click this link to a separate video in which I'll show you how to do it on the board. We'll now move on to talking about buffer solutions. Solutions that contain a weak acid and its conjugate base, such as the examples that we just mentioned in the common ion effect slides, resist drastic pH changes when small amounts of strong acid or strong base are added to them. Such solutions are called buffered solutions. Buffered solutions resist pH changes because they contain both an acid, which can neutralize any added hydroxide, and a base, which will neutralize any added proton. In our previous example that we talked about a few minutes ago here, our acid was acetic acid, which once again can neutralize any hydroxide, and our base was sodium acetate, which once again can neutralize any added proton. The take home from this that I want you to remember is that a buffered solution is a solution that contains a weak acid, and it has to be a weak acid, and its conjugate base. Let's take a look then at a sample problem. A solution containing which one of the following pairs of substances will be a buffer solution. Now, I'm not going to tell you the answer, but I will give you a hint. Remember that a buffer solution must contain a weak acid and a source of its conjugate base. I invite you then to do this on your own. Then if you like, you can click the link here to a separate video, which I show you how to do it on the board. Now, we can calculate the pH of a buffered solution by first using our common ion effect approach to find the H plus concentration and then using our equation for pH or by second, using the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. That equation is this one right here, where the base concentration refers to the concentration of your conjugate base, or sodium acetate in this example that I've been talking about earlier. And the concentration of acid refers to the concentration of your acid, which is acetic acid in this previous example. Also, just so you know, the pKa is equal to the negative log of the Ka. That takes us to a great problem. What is the pH of a buffer solution that is 0.211 molar in lactic acid and 0.111 molar in sodium lactate? The Ka of lactic acid is 1.4 times 10 to the negative fourth. Now, I would like you to show how to solve this problem using both the common ion effect approach and the henderson hasselbalch equation. As usual, you're welcome to attempt this on your own, and then if you like, you can click the link here to a separate video in which I will show you how to do it on the board. With that said, we'll now learn some more about buffered solutions. A buffered solution has a buffer capacity, which is the amount of acid or base that that buffer can neutralize before the pH will start to change appreciably. A buffer's pH range is the pH range in which the buffer will still act effectively. At this point, I've inserted just for the fun of it, a picture of a monkey that I drew on an exam that I took back in grad school. <laughs> it's a monkey. Yeah, I didn't really do well on that exam. That takes us to the end of this video. Please stay tuned to the next video in which I will teach you about acid-based titrations. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.